to welcome again to this uh, plant life webinar about important plant areas at the heart of global action for a plant rich world. Um, my name is Jenny Hawley. I'm the policy manager for plant life uh, based in the UK. And um, I'm really pleased to welcome our panel of speakers today. Really looking forward to this session to, to explore what's happening on important plant areas around the world. So it's, thank you for joining us. It's great to have everyone here. Uh, I'm just going to give a short introduction to important plant areas or IPAs, and then I'll pass on to um, our first speaker. Uh, just a few points to note. Uh, so if you have technical questions or inquiries, please use the chat function in Zoom. Uh, if you have questions for the speakers, put, please put those in the Q&A box. And we'll come to those at the end of all the presentations. We'll have about 20 minutes for questions and answers from our speakers. So please put your questions there. And just to note that the session is being recorded, so it will be available on uh, Plant Life's YouTube channel, which is Plant Life Video. So just a little bit of background about IPAs. So these are the most important plants, uh, places in the world for wild plant and fungal diversity. And they're identified by three criteria. So firstly, the threatened species, which are present in the area, the botanical richness of the site, uh, and that includes socially, economically, and cultural, culturally valuable plants. And thirdly, uh, the threatened habitats. So IPAs help countries to prioritize their areas of their country for legal protection and for practical conservation to know where, where to go and how to do it, uh, to monitor progress on their biodiversity commitments and strategies, uh, to raise national awareness of and pride in the biodiversity, which stimulates community-led guardianship and citizen science. And we'll hear a lot today about how local communities have been involved in IPAs in the, in the different countries where our speakers are, are working. And finally, to bring together expert knowledge on the country's flora, and to help scientists and conservationists to work together and collaborate to, to take their, uh, their objectives forward. So those are IPAs. Uh, Plant Life's international work on IPAs has evolved since the early 2000s, so going on for 20 years now. Uh, the global criteria were published in 2004 and just recently updated in 2017. IPAs were recognized uh, in the global strategy for plant conservation as part of target five, which has really helped to focus uh, attention and focus action on, on moving forward with identifying and restoring IPAs. Uh, we have had quite a focus on Europe and the Mediterranean, as you'll see from some of the publications that are uh, copied in the, the slide there below. And I just want to highlight the, the collaboration that Plant Life has had with the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew uh, in particular. So thanks to them and to IUCN for working closely with us. I should say, and I should have said at the beginning um, that I'm giving this presentation and hosting today on behalf of my colleague, Karen Inwood, who unfortunately wasn't able to be here today and had to send her apologies. Um, so I'm hoping to, to take her place and, and do a decent job on her behalf. I just wanted to highlight that we have an IPA database, um, which you can access at plantlifeipa.org. And that has information on um, at least 26 countries in Central and Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean. We now have at least 69 countries with IPA initiatives ongoing, whether that's identifying or conserving or engaging local communities, and we'll hear more about that. And in the UK, that, IPAs form the basis of much of Plant Life's own practical conservation work, and we have identified 165 IPAs in the UK. So this guidance and the database is, is available for, for everyone to use. And I think moving beyond what we can do at that national level, Plant Life really wants to see IPAs used internationally as a tool for global action. And obviously this is a big year for, for global action around global action around nature and uh, the climate. 
And we want to see every country identifying, protecting and restoring IPAs, not just for their plant diversity, but to benefit um, nature as a whole, local people and our climate to really make the most of those, those important areas. As part of that, we want to see IPAs recognised in the new global biodiversity framework, which will be agreed um, next year now. It's been the final conference been postponed to next spring. Um, and also for IPAs and wild plant diversity to be recognised at the COP26 coming up in Glasgow in the UK in just a few weeks time um, as a nature based solution to climate change. So that's something that can really help to, to, to tackle climate change in terms of mitigation and adapting and living with climate change. We also want to encourage community based conservation within IPAs and for those IPAs to, to benefit their local communities and people to be involved. And we want to do this partly by building a thriving global network for IPAs with collaborative programmes of action across the world. And that's something that we've been exploring um, this year, particularly we had uh, a meeting in July 2021, which was um, had uh, lots of people from all around the world from four different continents, which was fantastic to see. And we had even more people who were interested. We had 80 people interested um, from 38 countries. And this map just shows the, the fantastic spread of people who are now um, involved in IPAs and interested in working together internationally to, to take this programme forward. So if you'd like to get involved, you can uh, do so and you'd be very welcome. You can join us by emailing international.inquiries at plantlife.org.uk. So that's it for me. Um, we now have uh, short presentations from our three speakers uh, from Cameroon, Bolivia and Armenia. So I'm very pleased to welcome them here today. We'll speak for about 10 minutes each and then we'll move on to questions from the audience. So I'm now going to uh, stop sharing and bring up uh, Jean-Michel's presentation. So bear with me one minute. And welcome to Jean-Michel from the University of Yaoundé and the National Herbarium of Cameroon. Okay. So, uh, thank you for giving me the floor. I'm going to talk about Cameroon Tipas. Next. Next, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, TIPAS are a Q plant life initiative to help catalyze use of IPAS in the tropics where global plant diversity is disproportionately located. New IPA criteria recognize the importance of social, economic, and cultural useful plant species for tropical countries has Cameroon, you can see on the map in West Central Africa. Next. Cameroon, in fact, is uh, Africa in miniature. We use variety of habitats as described below. And you can see on the pictures. You have the highest plant diversity per degree square in tropical Africa. Next. Please. In the State of the World Trees report by Botany Gardens Conservation International in 2021, this year, in Africa, Cameroon has the second highest number of total trees and third national endemics, the highest number of threatened trees in mainland Africa, and the second highest percentage of threatened trees in mainland Africa. Main threats to Cameroon plants are conversion to land agriculture, illegal logging, smaller threats are mining, hydroelectricity, hydro grazing, urban spread. Next, please. In fact, next, thank you. Q and National Herbarium are in a partnership for assessing Cameroon flora. It's in fact a history of research. It's a history of research and conservation work. You have series of surveys and conservation checklists, subsequent protected areas, 
and a checklist of vascular plants. You have also 815 species assessed as globally threatened in the red data book. What about protection for Cameroon's plant diversity? Cameroon is party to CBD. Cameroon Forest Law voted in 1994, where it is said that at least 30% of national land area are to be protected. And in fact, around 30% are officially protected in accordance with our NBSAP. Many protected areas were chosen for large animals, but not for plants, but now there are national parks and all are proposed tipas. The Red Data Book identifies hotspot that would later become proposed tipas. Next, please. Tipas Cameroon so far. We started by an opening, opening workshop organized in Cameroon almost five years ago, but funding for Cameroon starting only last year. Data has been gathered for 41 TIPA sites so far. Many additional species were assessed. Now we have 735 threatened species for Cameroon listed in the ofi official IUCN red list. The proposed TIPA site so far incorporate about 600 of these threatened species. Next, please. In, now we have the case study of Ebo Forest. That is a forest in the littoral region. It's about of 2,000 hectares of evergreen lowland submountain forest, as you can see the canopy on the picture. Research by geologists noted that they noted the presence of primates, gorillas, chimpanzee grills, some endemic. But it was botanically almost unknown until 21st century. Then it was found to be very rich. We had 800 plant species has been found, has been recorded. That is one tenth of Cameroon flora. Among them, 16 new species, eight local endemics, and 75 IUCN red list species. Next, next please. Then the Ebo Forest, here's, here you have another view. Please, back, <laughs> back please. Yes, thank you. Uh, you have here another view of on the growth, typical freshwater habitat and endemic new eponym species discovered during inventories. Then, okay, thank you. That is the one <laughs> I needed. So you have a view of the, on the growth of the Ebo forest with typical, um, with typical freshwater habitats and endemic new eponym species recovery, recovered during inventories. In this Juma River, you have this river width in Vesodicrea Ebo. And on the ground, you have this terrestrial plant, Fedo Igrosomes Ebo, both endemic to Ebo forest. Now, next. Ebo forest is under threat. Thank you. In 2020, Plants were released for logging concessions, but local opposition came from villagers and international opposition. Q joined of other institutions signing letter to Cameroon president with support detailed TIPAS data, which shows strong evidence of global botanical significance. Campaign supported on social media as far as by Hollywood actor Leonardo DiCaprio. Logging plans were approved by the Ministry of Forestry 
in July 2020, but campaigning led to them being revoked in August by the president. That was a huge success for conservation, but the status of this forest remains uncertain. Next, please. But already we have local action at EBO, like this zebra project. It's a three-year project targeting livelihood and conservation. The context or justification of this zebra wood or zingana, that is the trade name, is that it is an IUCN critically endangered species threatened by logging. As you can see, it is sold $600 per cubic meter in the black market in the seaport city Douala. You have about 2,000 illegally revoked, removed from Ebo each month, and there is no remaining seed bearing trees predicted in just two years. On the picture, you have a team of the project during the launching ceremony, and up you have above, you have the a nursery and how the wood looks like. Next, please. Then, as we said, local action include already nursery, established nurseries, sensitize and strengthen the capacity of local communities on the techniques of domestication of fruit trees with high market value to generate more income. You have the reintroduction of 5,000 zebra wood plants, developed a managed and generation plan and proposal for its inclusion in the CITES appendix, build the capacity of Cameroonian biologists on the use of IUCN red list categories and criteria to access more species. Next. Stories for other uh, sites are about the wild coffee, Kofea Mounty Copensis, promoted at Bakosi area. A Western journalist visiting Cameroon later contacted Dr. Martin Chick at you to inquire about this wild coffee that local people and that local people had proudly spoken of. Dovialus Cameroonensis, material promoting this mountain tree were so successful that local people at Q located a population of trees and successfully campaigned for a road to be rerouted to avoid its destruction. You have the Dome Community Forest Abamenda, proudly protected by local people. And you have ANCO, Community Seedling Conservation and Reforestation, a dome with native species and income for local people. Next, please. Then you have, next, on the pictures, you have, no, back, back, back. <laughs> please, back, the anchor reforestation. Okay, thank you. The anchor reforestation with native legume species, Newtonia Cameroonensis. Next, please. <laughs> the picture of anchor reforestation with native legume species, Newtona Cameroonensis. Okay, thank you. And you can see local people working in the field for the reforestation with this local legume species. And the picture of the legume species on your right. Next. Uh, you have also critical threat to Tifa, the case of Mon Elephant. Next, please. Next, next. Mon Elephant is a proposed Okay. Mon Elephant is proposed Tifa with almost 30 globally threatened species. Back, please. Loss of surrounding forest exposes the slope to fire. And most of the forest, thank you. And most of the forest of this region is being 
converted to palm oil. You can compare the photo. Photos taken in 1997 on your left and 2015 on your right, which shows the state of the deforestation of this area just after 18 years. Now, this work is done with partners organization, as you can see on the list. Next, next, please. To show the partner organizations. Partner organizations. The next, okay, thank you. As you can see on the list, there are really many of them. And we are happy that so many organizations are interested in our keepers in Cameroon. So thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Jean-Michel. That's a um, fantastic overview of what's happening in Cameroon and those particular case studies. It's great to see how local people have got involved in protecting those sites and, um, and helping to conserve them and bring back some of those species. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to Marisol Toledo um, and her presentation from Bolivia. Marisol. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation to this important event at world level. So it's, it's nice to see all the people working in other countries with this program. So uh, I will present today the program TIPA in Bolivia. As you see here, uh, this program is a initiative from the Royal Botanic Gardens together with the Museo de, the Museo de Historia Natural Noelken Mercado. And here is all the team working in this program. Uh, well, as you know, IPAS and after TIPAS was very important developed in, in all the world. I can see that that is uh, also for an initiative to protect the plants around the world. So, and the socioeconomic value that the people now are giving this new criteria for EPAS is very important, especially in countries that are so diverse in cultural uh, terms of view, but not only plants. So in that way, uh, we can see in the map that Bolivia uh, is the first country in Latin America that has this program. In Bolivia, we start in 2017, and we decide to work uh, in one very rich uh, region, which is uh, the Chiquitania. Uh, we are located with this program in, in Santa Cruz department. And you can see in the map that Bolivia is located in South America, and we have uh, influence from different um, biomas like uh, Amazon, the Cerrado, the Pantanal. So in that way, Bolivia as Cameroon and other tropical countries, we are very rich in terms of plant diversity. Well, why the Chiquitania? Uh, Chiquitania is an ecoregion in Santa Cruz department. As maybe you know, Bolivia as a country has nine departments and Santa Cruz is the biggest country, but also is very diverse. And we work on, in the Chiquitania because it, it's a mosaic of different habitats and ecosystem. We have a high degree of endemism on plants, but also there are very uh, several uh, threats to the land use change uh, for local people, especially for uh, agriculture activities and other uh, threats but also a very important uh, criteria that we use to select Chiquitania is the botanical database. We have a rich uh, studies in, 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 in Bolivia, but are more focused in some areas. And we have like a more than 
5,000 uh, records for this area. So there are several projects. We did a um, different uh, publication also for this area. And that's important to, to select a one type of, one uh, type of site, sorry. Well, the program uh, in Bolivia uh, has different, we can say phases, uh, different ways to, to work in this program. First, uh, we have workshops in order to define with local experts and also uh, the support from international experts from the Kew Garden, Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, not only botanists, but also ecologists, conservationists for UCN evaluations in order to define what site in Bolivia is more important. We have, like I say, many sites, but we have to start for one. And we decided the Chiquitania because it is a very interesting place. And you can see here the documentation also was the next phase, like a, a visiting to national and international herbarium to review the data and also field work in key sites or areas with information gaps. Uh, Bolivia is one of the richest country in floristic diversity, but is also one of the less studies. And also we have a uh, field work assessment for species and for these uh, sites. Other way to, to work on the next phase was uh, the training capacity in the country. We have a uh, first international, I can say, uh, sorry, an inter a national workshop with international uh, assessor from UCN Red List. After these people was trained, uh, we try to share our knowledge for the students. So undergraduate and graduate students were participating in two uh, courses about these TIPAS and UCN methodology. And other way to, to train the people, to local people in order to increase uh, this in knowledge in TIPA methodology, but also in the UCN extension risk assessment is about uh, students preparing thesis. We have now six, six Bolivian uh, women uh, almost, almost finishing the thesis about uh, the, the, these TIPA uh, sites. Well, here in the map, you can see the, until now we have 18 sites identified in the Chiquitania, different uh, sizes. Uh, uh, they are based in endemic plant species, of course, and we found more than 160 uh, plant endemic. And also this endemic uh, threatened species or with extinction risks, we find more than 100. And this uh, study also gave for us a new plant species. You can see different families like Anacardiaceae, Amaranthaceae, Asteraceae, Bignoniaceae, Euphorbiaceae, Nictaginaceae, and Rubiaceae are families that we find new species. And we have at least 12 new species that the botanists are describing now. So in total, we have uh, 290 plant species for these uh, 18 TIPA sites. So there are really very interesting studies with this program and we have uh, more work to do. This net, uh, TIPA network is composed uh, for different uh, kind of land, like uh, national parks, departmental and municipal protected areas, we have also indigenous territories, private reserve and private properties. So these uh, sites are in different kinds of uh, land and that also is very interesting in order to protect these sites. Well, uh, we recognize that this program is very important for protection of sites and that especially has to take into account for authorities for uh, decision makers in order to really do something for these areas that we, that has many species interesting. So in, in Bolivia, for example, in Santa Cruz, we had the first uh, meeting with the local government of Santa Cruz 
and they are including some areas uh, in the priority conservation sites in, in the plan master of protected areas. So that was the very important result that we uh, we have with this program. Uh, we are working still, as you know, we started in 2017 and we are uh, five years with a lot uh, results, but we know that still we have to do a lot. So the next phase, uh, we have to do more dissemination to different local actors and also uh, more authorities in order to protect these areas and conserve the species. And, um, and also uh, we are working for publication for scientific community in order to, to publish the new species, but also uh, we have to, to to prepare more projects, like uh, to, to do more uh, work because the area is very rich, but also there are many, many threats uh, that are affecting our diversity. So uh, that's uh, all that I have to share with you about uh, the TIPA program in Bolivia. It's a new program for us. So you are invited to, to visit the the TIPA sites and also to, to work with us in order to discover new species, but the most important to protect these areas because they are very important, not only for Bolivia, no, but also for, for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marisol. That's fantastic to, to hear what's happening in Bolivia and everything that's been achieved in such a, a short space of time, just a few years is, uh, is really inspiring. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Anna Azashreyan from Armenia and um, uh, yeah, start, start the presentation. Mm -hmm. So over to you, okay. Anna. Hi. Uh, sorry. Uh -huh. Hello. Uh, Thank you, Jenny. I want to send my greetings to the audience and to express my gratitude to Plant Life International for organizing this event. I will share with pleasure about important plant areas project of Armenia and the participation of local communities in our conservation and research work. Uh, Armenia uh, is a very small country uh, uh, next slide, please. In the uh, ca Caucasian uh, ecoregion, and uh, so it, it forms part of the Caucasus hotspot, one of the global hotspots for, for biodiversity. Armenia is very small. Its territory is uh, less than 30,000 uh, square kilometers. And on this small territory, one can find 3,800 uh, vascular plant species. 144 of which are Armenian endemics. Um, next slide, please. Um, the important plant areas project st started in 2003, and the uh, and um, uh, the beginning uh, was uh, directly linked with my uh, participation in uh, international uh, diploma course in plant conservation techniques at Royal Botanic Gardens Q. And uh, due to the lecture uh, from Elizabeth Radford, uh, the international program manager of Plant Life International at that time, I heard for the first time about important plant areas project. And so uh, very quickly I decided to um, prepare the presentation of my project in the framework of the course uh, dedicated to the important plant areas of Armenia, uh, criteria and strategy for selection. Next slide, please. And by lucky coincidence, uh, my project proposal uh, sent to the Rufford Foundation was approved and in 2003 with the support from this foundation, we uh, began um, uh, research and identification of the sites important for, uh, from the point of view 
of uh, plant diversity and important for our conservation of plant diversity. The next year we joined Plant Europe Network, uh, which also played an important role in the development and implementation of our uh, project. Uh, the, with the continuation support from Rafford Foundation, we managed to uh, finish the identification of the important plant areas of Armenia. Next uh, slide, please. And uh, at 2016, uh, we, uh, we had this uh, picture, 32 uh, sites selected. Uh, we, uh, 22 of the total 32 IPAs contain our overlap with the important plant areas of Armenia. And uh, so about 60% of Armenia's protected areas total uh, areas covered by IPA network. Uh, the IPA's data was submitted to Plant Life for the IPA's uh, European online database. Uh, the data was updated in 2018. And uh, th this work was also important that it, is, it play, uh, became uh, a base for um, the, uh, this data served as uh, one of the layers for identification of key biodiversity areas and conservation landscapes for Armenia and so for the region as well. Next slide, please. Uh, on uh, this uh, picture, uh, you may see I marked those IPAs, which following our, um, uh, the completion of our identification process, these IPAs have been covered or involved in various uh, research and conservation projects by my colleagues. Uh, in, for more detailed research and more uh, detailed conservation, uh, both uh, the vascular plants and lichens were studied on these areas. Next slide, please. Um, I want to talk today a bit more about uh, uh, crop wild relatives, particularly wild pears. So I have to mention that territory of Armenia uh, belongs to one of the most ancient uh, areas of development of agriculture and domestication of uh, plants. So um, till uh, today, we have a huge number of uh, crop wild relatives uh, represented in uh, huge genetic diversity in Armenia. Next slide, please. Uh, talking about wild pears of Armenia, this uh, group of plants uh, is one of the most interesting. And, uh, there are 32 species in total in our flora, which forms uh, about half of all known species of pears. Uh, 18 of them have been described from Armenia. We have uh, 10, uh, 12 endemics and 10 are in the IUCN red list of threatened species. Next slide, please. Uh, on this picture, you may see just part of the diversity of fruit shapes and colors and uh, just morphology of fruits and wild pears, just a small part. In fact, there are lots and lots of uh, hybrids and uh, different forms, except the species. Next slide, please. And uh, on this picture, you may see a di morphological diversity of leaves of wild pears. The narrow shaped ones are, belong to species which uh, are found in more dry areas. Uh, those which larger uh, leaves uh, are found in more mesophyll humid uh, habitats in forests and forest glades. Next, uh, please. Just a few pictures to show you that in nature, we often find the examples of fruits which uh, just repeat the well-known sorts, which you can see in the fruit market. And the big one is both in the fruit market, a small one collected in the field. Next two slides, please, one by another. So that's really interesting. Uh, next, please. Um, 
the uh, I, uh, our work, more um, ambitious work on conservation of Armenia's threatened pest species began in 2016 and then continued with seven, uh, the next two years with uh, a few scoping grants uh, from Fauna and Flora International under the Global Trees Campaign. And during those um, uh, projects, uh, we managed to do a preliminary studies of uh, distribution area for some particular endemic and globally threatened species, and to collect a general picture on the main threats. And uh, we also established a network of local contacts. Um, next slide, please. A uh, more ambitious project as a continuation of the previous studies uh, began uh, last year. Uh, this is a three-year project supported by Foundation for Frank Linea. And it, uh, it is um, implemented uh, by Armenian Society of Biologists. And the main aim is um, to uh, protection of five uh, target threatened pest species, globally threatened ones, and uh, with further uh, reintroduction uh, them into the natural habitats. Next slide, please. Uh, on this picture, you may see uh, uh, global uh, so-called hotspots for wild pear diversity in Armenia. This all this is also a result of our work on the above mentioned projects. And three of these hotspots are located in Vyazor province, which is a target area of implementation of the uh, current project on conservation of wild pears. Next slide, please. Um, just, uh, I want to show you those five target species. Um, critical endangered Pyrus gergerana. Uh, next, please. Pyrus derelagesi, more mesophile species, which is found in forest glades and uh, above the forest line. Next one, please. Uh, Armenian pyr pyrus or pyrus hyastana with reddish, very interesting one. It, it's found in dry areas. So you may see a shrub like uh, forms uh, of the species. Next one, please. And pyrus sosnovsky with very small leaves and small piriform fruits, rather, taste, rather tasty ones. And next, uh, pyrus tamamshiana. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we work closely with local communities uh, in, during all our work. We have a network of local contacts uh, established during previous projects, and we find new and new enthusiastic people in local communities. Uh, the interesting thing is they know uh, many pear trees and they uh, use, of course, they use fruits and they know exactly which is good for com compote or jam, which is good for pickles. But, yes, they make pickles, pear pickles, and which is good for vodka, for example. Uh, but we scientists, uh, we had to share with them that they are hold this uh, huge, important um, uh, uh, natural uh, heritage, which is uh, of global importance for conservation. And of, of course, of practical importance as well as a genetic material for further selection works, for example. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, some photos demonstrating our work with uh, our local pear caretakers. We have about six uh, local contacts who are involved in our project as pear caretakers. They uh, uh, do the main work on monitoring of the big trees, on working with our local uh, people involved in the project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, next, uh -huh. uh, our aim is to collect fruits, uh, to clean uh, seeds, and uh, 
to establish nurseries, as I will show you later. So all these works on, on place are coordinated by, by our pay caretakers. The next slide, please. And uh, here are your majesty. Um, uh, we also um, applied to Backyard Nurseries Initiative as uh, more than 10 local people. They created small backyard nurseries next to their houses where they, under our management uh, support, with the support, uh, they grew uh, not only pear trees, but uh, other uh, trees of, from local uh, habitats uh, to use the seedlings, uh, the young uh, samplings for further ecosystem restoration works. Next, please. Uh, and in Artavan, uh, next to Artavan village, we uh, created uh, Artavan conservation nursery, a larger nursery where uh, not only pear trees, but other trees, as I mentioned before, other tree and shrub species are uh, grown, uh, which may be used further in conservation work. By the way, the income uh, generated from the sale of the uh, samplings from the backyard nurseries is aimed to, and these nurseries aim to support further monitoring activities uh, uh, on our target species. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, in the botanical garden here, uh, we also created a small nursery. Uh, uh, me, uh, myself, I uh, keep an eye on this and uh, just manage this uh, small nursery. We are planning to have more and more seedlings this year and next year. And next slide, please. And uh, just uh, so a few photos demonstrating our work on education, raising the awareness. Please, next slide. Uh, these are just photos from our IPS projects in general, not just pairs. Next one, please. Um, just uh, we always involve uh, locals in our field work. We organize uh, so educational field trips. And next slide, please. Uh, and next one. Uh, I just wanted to show pickled pears, which are very tasty, and uh, they are made in Biosdor province. Next one. Um, just an importance of uh, locals, and uh, they, they live in harmony, in fact, and we learn a lot from locals. And the most important is to make this collaboration uh, effective. Uh, we have real success for which I'm very happy and hope we'll continue this way. Uh, next slide, um, just the last picture. I want to show you this chalk picture, which uh, granddaughter of the chief forester in one of our project areas was pa a painting, a drawing, uh, while we were talking to her grandfather about wild pear project and the importance of their conservation. And this picture more than anything demonstrates how uh, uh, effective can be just a uh, uh, simple uh, open talk communication with locals about this, uh, the, the importance of conservation of plants for them, for us, and of, for future generations. Uh, thank you very much. The next slide, of course, the last one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I finished. Thank you, Anna. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, some wonderful photos there and a really good um, insight into to, to what's happening. Uh, with with your work and all the people involved um we've got a question actually just to follow up specifically on your presentation um we've got a question that's come in um to what extent are people around local people around these pear trees allowed to collect and harvest the fruits and are the local farmers involved in crossbreeding to get the best fruit for their preferences um, the locals, they are uh, historical, they have always, um, they live uh, surrounded with these fruit trees, many fruit trees, and they collect them and use 
in various uh, for various purposes. There are some companies which uh, produce uh, compote from uh, at least from wild pears, but uh, the species uh, which is used for that is one of the most uh, common ones. Not uh, as far as I heard from locals, but uh, you know, um, and uh, the, what uh, about crossbreeding? Uh, no, new sorts. Um, there are. Uh, I haven't heard about uh, works uh, related to the pears or uh, at the moment. Maybe there are some works done in agricultural uh, industry. I haven't heard yet, uh, but in past, uh, probably, uh, maybe in the middle of last century, there were some activities, but at least uh, until we don't have that capacity to work hardly on the selection works, we have to protect the first what we have, and then with the hope to use it in the near future. This is just our aim. That's great, thank you. Um, and just another quick question uh, as whether your project focuses on apples, wild apples as well. Um, uh, not we, we focused on uh, pears uh, yet, but it's such a big and interesting group that it will, may take too long till we come to <laughs> But if, uh, maybe if there is a new project on apples, we may do that at the same time, why not? That's great, thank you. Um, can I ask all of the speakers to put their cameras back on, please? Um, and we'll uh, take some questions uh, for everyone. So thank you so much, Anna. That's um, that's been fascinating. That's a pleasure. Um, and I love, yes, I love the, the idea of pair caretakers. That's, that that word in English, caretaker, is um, is one we should use more often. I think. Um, so um, so we've got a question from Michael Scott about uh, carbon stored in IPAs. And I think I mentioned as well this, uh, you know, we want to see IPAs recognized as one of the solutions to climate change and the climate, the climate crisis. And obviously we've got the, the big conference coming up in, uh, in a few weeks time. Um, so I wonder if any of the speakers have um, looked at IPAs or done assessments of the carbon that's stored in those IPAs or the role that IPAs can play in helping to helping us to adapt to climate change, or you know, and I think some of the the work around um, uh, crop wild relatives, particularly, is you know, is really important for this as well. So, can I just open that to any of the the speakers to come in on that question, please? No. Okay, about uh, carbon seeking. Yes, thank you, Jean-Michel. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, tropical forests are really um, very important for climate change, not only for seeking carbon, but also for, um, for rains. We are now, we know now that when we have a closed canopy, Rains are all also uh, regular, so that even agriculture all is well. Uh, we can really uh, prioritize activities for agriculture, but especially for uh, carbon seeking, since IPAs are there not to the conservation, while uh, we have a sustainable um a sustainable uh, exploitation of the forest then we can say that tipas are very important for seeking carbon because as in cameroon you know it was supposed that this forest will be uh, concessions loggings that trees will be uh, removed from the forest but now with the tipa trees will stay and the population will be brought to do other activities. Even the government can gain taxes from other activities than taxes on logging. That is what I can say. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and I think we we just want you know it's been really interesting to hear how how much the local people around the uh, IPAs have been involved in the, the projects and you know that you're learning from their local knowledge and their their expertise and then and then they can get involved in helping to protect those areas. Um, how do you think we can bring those local voices out more to influence governments and decision makers and and the international level with these big uh, conferences happening in the next few months on climate and biodiversity you know how can are there ways that we can help to to make their voices heard um, beyond beyond the the, I, the IPAs or TIPAs and and into those kind of government spaces uh, I can just uh... If you allow yes, please, Anna. Uh, just uh, to to be open to share our results, which we do regularly, and uh, we share the results not only with public, general public, but also with authorities, who uh, with governmental bodies. What about our project? Uh, the governmental representatives have visited the project areas, the nurseries, backyard nurseries, they are aware of the work. We have organized uh, meetings uh, with presentations where they attend uh, as well. And we plan to share our results with those who make decisions and who are interested in uh, data which will form a base for further, further management and conservation of our plant diversity. We always share. That's, thank you, Anna, that's great. Marisol, did you have anything on that? Because you talked to, in your presentation about the, the protection, people are getting involved in protection of their areas. Yeah, as you realize, uh, we are a little bit young, I can say, in this program. And we are we start with the, the, the field work, the, the obtain the, the site because it's not easy in Bolivia, especially because of the the resources, economical resources to do research. We don't have government support. So it's a, for international support that we have a lot of research in Bolivia. But we realize that the, we have to do this because it's very important to to like uh, Anna say, uh, is not only uh, disseminate to some public, we have to work with this authority that has the political decision to protect areas. But it's not easy because uh, we have in, in Bolivia, and I, of course, I know there are in other countries, many, many uh, threats to the, these areas. Uh, is is the, the, the situation for every day. No? The people has to survive, uh, they need money, they need to, to use the, the resources and to find this equilibrium, this harmony with the nature is the, is the, the homework, I can say that uh, it's not easy, but we realize that uh, we have to do, we have also to work in a, in, in, multidisciplinary teams uh, with uh, socialists, with uh, social workers, sorry, with a uh, politician, with a uh, biologist. Yeah, we have to, to work in more uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary way in order to really protect these areas. Yes, thank you, Marisol. And that's, that's absolutely true. And, um, and I think across different countries as well as within within each country, we need to, to do more on that. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. That was um, a fascinating session and just so good to hear those stories and the progress that's um, taking place on IPAs in all these different countries. I think we can uh, continue to take, take this forward and we're working with my colleague Karen as well um, to build up this global IPA network. Um, like I said, we had a meeting in July and that's something that we'll be continuing on. So please do get in touch if you want to be on the email list for, for that network. And if you want to um, join in with us and see how we can take this forward um, across different countries and to make, um, to, you know, to build on all this fantastic work that's, that's happening and give, give it a bigger voice at the international level as well. So I'd like to thank 
uh, our three speakers again today. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. It's been really fantastic to, to hear from you and to have you with us today. Thank you to everyone else for, for joining and for your questions. Um, and I hope you will join up with our global network and, and um, help us to build this into a bigger collaboration. Uh, thank you to Felicity for uh, engineering the whole, the whole session. And thanks to Carmen, um, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today to, um, for, for getting the session together in the first place and um, all her work in, in taking the IPA programme forward. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you too. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.